now we come to Nathan's entry, which is bustling with really intriguing ideas and approaches. But I just have to sort of comment on the quality of the mock-up there, and that is that, Nathan, if you are uh, working with that sound set all the time, it may be uh, confusing your ear into you know what works together well, what is possible, what um, what tones really support and complement one another. And I, I would recommend trying out Note Performer to see if that is something that will give you more kind of more lifelike uh, mock-ups so that you can you can just maybe judge a little bit better on some of the decisions that you're making okay um, it's um, it's it addresses a lot of the criteria that I've got like pitch weight and the upper middle register and you know maintaining a driving staccato and so on upper middle register being used right in here. You're filling in your sound picture all the way through really nicely, uh, really in a really full way. Um, you're dealing with the issue of the uh, uh, melodic development jumping up pretty high by just dropping down, right? Um, and uh, like here we kind of run into the problem of, of there not being an illusion, right? There is no There is no like piccolo part starting low and then climbing all the way up in a straight line and the other instruments dropping down before they get too high. There is no real attempt to fool the ear into thinking that things are all climbing up to their highest point altogether, right? And so when you have this really calculated drop right in here, the ear hears it and says, oh, wow, we went up to that really high note right up in there uh, and you know, all the way up to F, and then we dropped down and then we climbed up to E, right? So there, there isn't like a sense of illusion in there at all uh which which i think you need to address right um accompaniment figures you kind of got around uh, by kind of breaking them up a little bit here and there or just avoiding them entirely and throwing in your own thing and i was really intrigued by the counterpoint that you threw in now sometimes it just it kind of did not really follow the rules of counterpoint in a way that that you know was of the period of the score right um, I'm not going to make any comments about anybody's approach to counterpoint because I don't want to turn this into like a big lesson on that right uh, but I, I feel that just in terms of functionality some of this counterpoint needs to be worked on a little bit that you had in here some of your um, counter melodies and and other kinds of things going on i'm not saying that they totally don't work the idea that you are employing them is is quite fascinating i find and and a lot of the times to my ear they sort of almost work right that it's it's almost an idea that is that is you know pretty valid and is going to and is going to um lead somewhere but then like it just doesn't quite add up, right? So I would say that's something that you might want to work on as a separate issue to your orchestration. And once that is worked out, then the, you know, the obvious choice of instrument and how you're going to implement them in your orchestration and what support that adds to the overall picture will be much, much clearer, okay? So, um, that just leaves the question of whether or not you are being too repetitive in your treatment of different elements. And I would say overall you're not because you are varying your approach quite, um, you know, quite often. And the counterpoint actually helps that. It helps things stay, um, keep from becoming the same all the time. In, in addition to just like a you know, leaving, like, for instance, leaving out the flutes um, and repeating the bees and so on. I mean, there, there are a few little things that you throw in there. So, so you are addressing a lot of my criteria in a very positive way, in a very proactive way. And, um, you know, there's, there's this 
sort of thing that I'm sitting on the fence about, and maybe people can give me feedback there in the comments, and that is whether or not to publish the criteria when I release the entry at the beginning of the challenge, or whether just to hold off on it. Because like I like the idea of holding off on it because I don't want to tell people what to look out for and what to do and what not to do, aside from like those those um, pitfalls that I mentioned in the announcement that I felt were, you know, I just did not want to um, deal with entry after entry that had scored the piece way too fast for the orchestra to play it. Uh, kind of interesting that in this case we have the opposite, where you have a, ver a fairly slow um, tempo marked right in here. So, you know, the and then like the, the whole question of broken octaves being playable by bass instruments and so on. <clears throat> so aside from those kinds of concerns, <clears throat> I really kind of wanted to leave it up to the player to decide, you know, what the what their strengths and weaknesses were as orchestrators and and how they would see the whole task. <clears throat> so I think I might stick with that, but if people just really felt, hey, I really would feel that it wasn't fair, you know, that I didn't hear the or I didn't see the evaluation criteria and so on just i'd like to know that as well okay okay so <clears throat> so now let's talk about what works and what doesn't and why it does and why it doesn't all right so you're doing a lot of octaves in your horns okay and the proper partners for octaves and horns in this kind of an approach really are the first and second like here you're telling the players who are four seats apart <clears throat> to um, to play octaves together. And the first player wants the second player to be playing that low F sharp. Okay, because they're sitting right next to them and they can really nail the intonation. They don't want them to be, you know, over on the other side of the horn section. And same thing right in here, you know, really would be better to give it to the second. Because those players are used to playing in sync with each other and just just nailing any kind of little interval and whatever. Now here you are scoring fortissimo xylophone and fortissimo vibraphone, a vibraphone with um, <coughs> with hard mallets. And you have all this really intricate uh, um, pattern scoring right in here. And it's all perfectly possible, uh, you know. And and here you, it's kind of interesting. You've got uh, a double beam slash right in here for measured tremolo, but here it becomes like a a double beam slash with that is already has another beam, right? So that is as much as saying that this is unmeasured tremolo just on this one note, right? So I think that you're safer here having a double beam slash and a single beam right in here and then that you know then that is the correct notation and we'll get the best results from the player all right okay but the big problem in here it doesn't have anything to do with that it has to do with the fact that vibraphone and xylophone are about three degrees apart in terms of projection in terms of um tone weight all those other kinds of things is that, uh, uh, vibraphone is just something that does not sound very loud and you can hammer away at it with um, with hard mallets and and so on and you can actually knock the uh, tuning right off of a uh, of a metal tone bar by hitting it too hard so you know so it, it is it really isn't this almost pianistic solid ringing kind of sound that perhaps you are imagining Right, it is a kind of a calmer, quieter sound, and you can hit at it, you know, and sort of kind of make a get a bell-like sound. But really, you know, against the xylophone and the temple blocks, the sort of very, very dry sounds, the vibraphone, the vibraphone is going to add add a little bit of color and a little bit of sustain, but it really isn't going to contribute very much besides that. And then here, when you get to this really lovely pattern right in here it's it's really the effect of it is going to be lost against just the the um the excitement of the 
xylophone carrying on and uh, these winds right in here just doing their little run and then peaking with the upper winds with the and the marcato strings going on that is going to just completely swallow the vibraphone completely at this point right and and if it weren't for the fact that you also have trumpets and horns and then heavy brass um more active contrapuntally right in here that is all going to subtract from the vibraphone's ability to really make a, a significant contribution so those are concerns um another possible concern is I mean, this is actually something I like. Okay, so it's a it's it's feedback more than it is a critique, but I just think it's interesting how you are holding off on using your strings thematically, except for right in here, really, and just like the da 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 with the little pluck, and then just the da 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 kind of idea, um, continuing on. That, you know, and then there's like this sort of marcato lower stuff, which sort of gets, you know, it, there's more interesting and more active stuff going on in the winds at this point. Let's face it, you know, the their sound is going to be much more prominent, especially since you marked these parts forte and these mezzo forte, right? So like, you're putting the strings in pizzicato, right, behind the winds, the the sound of a pizzicato um, string group is going to be less than that of a staccato wind player, right? So it, you know, your your balance is all wrong if you wanted a blended sound here. It would be better for them both to be marked forte, right? And then you'll get a balance. Mezzo forte, uh, but it, and it's also kind of strange. Mezzo forte molto marcato, right? So marcato has the um, connotation of being a stronger, uh, more forceful kind of articulation, right? So, the, so it you know to tell them to play mezzo forte doesn't quite make sense. I mean, it is possible. I mean, you can have marcato in piano, right, or pianissimo, uh, technically speaking, because it's really kind of a more more of an articulation style, and uh, you know, than it is a dynamic. But it's just one that is supposed to be forceful, right? So you have that force going on here and you have the staccato and the forte score, uh, forte dynamics in the wind. So the balance is just really way off. And then you have the mezzo forte of the uh, pizzicato continuing and you have these other elements sort of dying off, which doesn't quite make sense to me, right? It, I, I mean, it would be better for them to overlap with the voices that are going to be taking over for them than it would be to diminuendo, right? The diminuendo just means that that voice is going to get softer while the other one carries on. So I think you need to rethink some of this a little bit. Okay, <clears throat> now we've got this yump, 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 bum, 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 and we've got this in parallel fifths, uh, and that's all perfectly fine. You know, you're reimagining this pretty strongly. And, um, but, you know, just to note, that's not the way that Faya scored it. Right. Um, I mean, it, it's it's a real interesting idea. Don't get me wrong. You know, clarinets, xylophone, and then an octave below uh, pizzicato on our violins, and then then the flute octaves on top. So it's it's. I mean, it's a it's a neat it's a neat idea. I'm not a big hater of parallel fifths, but you know, just just noting when they do and don't occur. Now here you're turning them into parallel triads with the introduction of the thirds right in here, but leaving the thirds out, right? That just forcing them to really be open fifths. <clears throat> it's kind of a cool idea actually. And then like here you start this this contrapuntal line right in here, uh, bass clarinet. And bassoons, how many bassoons? Right? How many bassoons are playing? Here you say, ah, two flutes, but how many here? Right? We need to know. But I'm assuming ah, two. So that's going to be a nice combination together. <coughs> All right. 
and then you know talked a little bit about the the confusion of the the contrapuntal lines um you know kind of maybe having too many at once or or not really having the counterpoint totally worked out and i mean you, you know the, there's a certain ivesian quality to that isn't there you know like the you know, charles ives just kind of throwing everything together and then that counterpoint just occurs from you know the way things smashed into each other and i mean sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't it's just you know if the confusion is for the sake of confusion that's one thing but obviously in this point you know you're trying to make a musical statement i think you were trying to have your functions have more of a meaning right and and they they still need some work yeah then you know more parallel triads yeah and then like right in here pizzicato strings now this is this is not quite going to work out the way that you think, right? So you are asking for a pizzicato uh, uh, grace note, right? And so that what that means is that the player is going to pluck this F double sharp and then finger the G sharp just by hammering down with the upper finger. And going uphill with this kind of you know slurred slurred pizzicato is always stronger than plucking and then releasing the finger to a lower finger so there's nothing really wrong with it it's just that i don't think that it is i mean this looks like a part that was originally marked arco and then you forgot to change it or something like that right you're just going to get a better scoop uh, you know the the idea of scooping up from the F double sharp to the G sharp is going to be much much stronger in other instruments like in in wind instruments and so on. So <clears throat> it might be just an easier idea just to have the second violins plucking G sharp and to have that scoop in the other instruments where they're just a, it's a lot more audible and a lot more effective. <clears throat> There's a couple of there's a couple of kind of confusing voice crossings. Like here you are having the first trumpet player drop down to C and then walk up to this E while you have the second playing the G over it, right? And and they just, they all sort of merrily go up together. And I'm, I'm just kind of not sure about like, what's the rationale for that? It's better to really keep the first player higher and the second player lower because they, you know, they're really used to like the second player is really used to supporting from below into making what they do fit into what's going on going up by putting the um, first player on this C you're basically saying that the C is the most important note and the second player has got to support the um, the first player on top of that and I don't think that's exactly what you intended to do right I mean, it's a, just a, it's, it's kind of cool, but like, once again, we had that whole problem of like running up to F and then dropping down and running up to E, um, so that like the, the, the drop becomes a really noticeable element, right? Becomes a part of the intentional fabric of the music. So you might want to, you know, it's the kind of thing where you might be better off with, uh, fixing this a little bit so that the, so that the piccolo walks all the way from an octave, you know, just drop this part an octave so that there is a one inter uninterrupted line walking all the way up to the very high E. That high E is very high, right? And then you can just have the drop right in here inside the music where it's less perceptible. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I respect the contrapuntal impulse, but I think that if you are really intent on it, you've got to give it a little bit more work. Now, this stuff right in here, um, kind of fun. You know, got these, uh, you've got these big octaves here and the viola in the middle and so on. That's, um, and then they're, you know, the same kind of stuff is happening in the horns. <clears throat> Trumpets are playing sixths and so on. That's kind of fun. Yeah, but once again, I, I feel that this needs a little bit of work. Okay, so, all right. So, like, once again, just like a, 
uh, a bundle of really, really great ideas. And I hope that I gave you a little bit of an ass of assistance right in here in you know thinking about certain things. Uh, one thing I, I would watch out for is turning this into uh, three bars of um, of two four time, right? The, the, with the way that you're emphasizing uh, every other beat, it just really feels like. You know, it's it's not da 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 one two three one two and three and it just really feels like one two one two one and two and one two one two because you've got that bong bong and then the D right so um, it's it's something that is kind of going past syncopation because there isn't really um, there isn't enough emphasis on the downbeat of the second bar to reveal the tension within the syncopation right. So now here, like we, this is, you, you resolve it right in here, but yeah, just, you know, that, that kind of, um, uh, you, you know, I, I just kind of changing the meter right in there it takes away some of the tension is what I'm trying to say. Okay. All right. Well, um, that is all I've got to say about this, except that I really appreciate you, uh, scoring it and sending it to me and putting in the work and coming w up with such great ideas and you know so different from everybody else's and especially in the use of of counterpoint and and other kinds of elements and you know throwing in vibraphone and xylophone and them being such integral parts of um of the score i, I mean i think i i just think it's wonderful i mean you've got you know and like and throwing the vibes right in here that's like not necessarily wrong right but uh just a question of whether or not the um the the sound is going to come through. So I'll just repeat my uh, my suggestion that you look into Note Performer, um, which you're hearing on a lot of these, uh, pretty much where, wherever I'm, um, almost in almost every single entry uh, that was with Sibelius that was sent to me. The the person who sent it opted for the option of using or of me just. Um, generating a note performer mock-up from their file so so you're hearing the sound of note performer all over the place and um you know that can sort of inform what you decide to do perhaps give you some some context about the use of that um sound set if you if you feel you need it if you don't don't worry about it but it just was a thought that occurred to me because some of the balance and the and the Tambral blending um, is 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 a bit rough, right? Okay, um, but that's all I'll say about it. Just except for once again to thank you for that and and to just really encourage you to just keep working on it because you've got some really great instincts and you've got some great ideas in here. And I I would really love to see what you could do with next year's entry, which is going to be completely different. I've already picked out the piece and. Um, and I think you'll really enjoy the, um, um, the piece that is coming up. I think it'll fit your sense of innovation. All right. Thank you. Thanks to all of the Patreon supporters and website subscribers. Now, on to the next entry. <laughs>